I'm not an expert about any of the science or the farming practices that this story is about. I'm just someone who got curious about the heat engine and went looking for solutions to the problems that it causes. My first thought was that the north of Western Australia is sparsely populated and remote, so it could be a good laboratory to try out some high-tech solutions to the problems of global warming. Along the way, I learned that there are plenty of low-tech solutions that we should probably be trying first. So far, this story is focused on helping nature to cool the country, but we need to keep an open mind to any possible solutions. Climate action in Australia has almost been entirely focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and transitioning to clean energy. Wind and solar generation is growing fast, but Australia, like other fossil fuel producing countries, is still digging, burning and exporting coal and gas. At this point, even if we could reduce gas emissions, the temperature would keep rising. Within the next few decades, it's almost certain that large regions will experience extremes of heat and humidity together that will be lethal to humans, animals and some food crops. Doesn't it make sense then to at least consider potential solutions? Humans have engineered the problem and we should be very cautious about trying to engineer a fix, but it may come to that. If it does, shouldn't we be prepared? The United States, China and India are three of the world's largest economies and all three have been suffering record-breaking summer heat the last few years. If large numbers of people start to die in any of those countries, their governments will act independently in their own interests. We should be talking about that. We are not implementing climate policies fast enough to stop emissions. And we're not investing in adaptation enough. Adaptation needs are anywhere from one to 10 trillion per year. And we're maybe investing a hundred billion. So could geoengineering be more cost effective? By the end of the century, the UN is telling us one million species at risk of extinction. One million. Uh, and so, you know, this kind of puts the climate emergency into context and how inadequate a lot of our interventions are. And that's the case for geoengineering. Can we use technology and human ingenuity to repair the climate and undo the past three or four centuries of mass damage to the atmosphere? One idea we've heard a lot about is carbon capture. Both direct air capture and carbon capture and storage, the consensus was not till at least 2045 and possibly 2055 or 2060. So that does imply that these options could play a huge role in 20 or 30 years. But if we're looking for like a near term, within five years deployment, they're not even close to ready. What does work now? So solar panels and wind power are the biggest two things you need to do for electricity and reforestation and better land use management. Those four things get you some huge magnitude of emissions reductions that's like greater than 20 or 30 other things combined. Is there any other engineered solution that could help? Solar radiation management, which is basically a fancy term for how do we reflect sunlight so that we can lower temperature. Put a shade over parts of the earth to like keep the sunlight from warming coral reefs and things like that. By spraying chemical particles in the stratosphere, right? Usually sulfur. Keep in mind as well that stratospheric aerosol injection will just be emitting a few tons potentially of things like sulfur, or a coal-fired power plant emits millions of tons a year. So it sounds bad in an absolute sense, oh, these planes are spraying particulates, but in a grand sense, it's gonna be less than like 0.001% of what we're already putting into the atmosphere anyway, so the additional increase in air pollution is negligible. And blown wherever the wind takes it. They would create asymmetries in protection, as in it's not even protection, it depends on how the aerosols disperse. And I think these sorts of dynamics are why we need more modeling, more science, more research, because if you deploy stratospheric aerosol injection, say, you know, in Queensland, it's gonna be very, very different than Detroit, Michigan. Very, very different than the Arctic. There is an alternative, using salt water instead of chemicals. Australia is already doing some amounts of kind of marine cloud brightening, and fogging and shading over the Great Barrier Reef. So I think Australia is clearly a world leader there. Salt particles sound more promising than sulfur. You may be opposed to any man-made solutions on the grounds that when humans interfere, we often make things worse. But given that we've been burning fossil fuels and pumping chemicals into the atmosphere to create global warming, humans have already interfered, right? 
I've talked with some very thoughtful people who believe that some sort of rebrightening of the Earth's albedo may be uh, needed sooner rather than later. And if we need to counter the pollution we've made, spraying a fine mist of salt water seems like probably the safest and simplest first step we should try. Professor Salter, we learned that the northwest of Australia generates almost all extreme heat events in our country. Reflecting back, sunlight seems the most viable human engineered solution. How would that work with clouds over the oceans? Reflectivity of clouds depends on lots and lots of things, but mainly it's the size distribution of the drops. If you have a large number of small drops, you get a white cloud, and if you have the same amount of water uh, in a smaller number of bigger drops, it looks much darker. Everybody who's heard the expression, the dark storm clouds are gathering, will understand that. OK, and how can you make white reflective clouds? We could uh, get a larger number of smaller drops by giving them more the tiny little condensation nuclear that you need to get a drop started. The little bit of salt that's left over from the evaporation of a small drop of seawater is just a perfect seed. And so the plan is to spray uh, the very large numbers of very, very small uh, drops into the air and over the sea. Is all that salt safe for the environment? Completely negligible compared with the amount that's already being thrown up by breaking waves. Doctors used to prescribe people to go for a sea change, to, to breathe some salt. And it, it really mm. is good for people with difficult lung problems. Where did the idea for marine cloud brightening first come from? A chap called John Latham. His idea depends on the work of a chap called Toomey, Sean Toomey, who was very interested in why some clouds look white and some clouds look darker. And he did a lot of experiments flying into clouds and measuring the sun coming down and the reflection coming back up. There is an argument that we could use chemicals to reflect sunlight back instead. Sulfur was one of the reflective chemicals we could use. We know it works because when ships were forced to remove most of it from their fuel, the sea surface temperatures spiked dramatically. That, that is a big effect, yes. Um, and it was that, it was the ship tracks that were observed when we first started getting satellite images that made Sean Toomey take up work on cloud brightness back in 1970. So sulfur is not good for people, whereas salt is. Are there other reasons you'd prefer to use salt? The short life of the spray, the spray will last there until the next time it rains. And having a short life means that you've got a really rapid way of controlling the spray or not spray according to what, what the, the, the conditions that we're trying to achieve. So what sort of conditions would you want to achieve other than cooling the oceans? Really, the way very well that the hurricanes need warm seas to, to get growing and you need maybe uh, one or two hundred vessels to knock down a, a, a hurricane. Two hundred vessels spraying tiny drops of salt could stop a hurricane? How? You don't want to wait until the hurricane's coming. You want to do it the year before and you'd have your vessels cruising around. Let's say if, if you're worried about hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico, you'd have they actually begin over on the African side. So you'd have them cruising in the Atlantic between Africa and uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And you designed the boats to do it? They're using uh, things called Fletner rotors and they do exactly the same job as a, a, a sail or an aeroplane wing, but they get a lot more lift than, than a wing would, would give you, uh, about maybe 10 times more. With hydrofoil wings to reduce drag? These uh, hydrofoils will have variable pitch and the ones at the bow might have that pitch increasing, this pitch reducing, and that will put a really big rolling torque on the vessel trying to make it do that. And then you balance it by doing the opposite at the stern. So what you have is big, big forces uh, trying to put twisting the, the hull like that. And you can couple those to high pressure oil hydraulic rams. What would that do? That will allow you to get the pressure that you want to pump the, uh, the, the salt water through a filter 
which are over all the plankton, and then through uh, a grid of holes to make the spray that we want. So the spray evaporates up, forming tiny salt crystals to create reflective cloud particles. But you need wind for the boats to work. We need about wind about three or four metres per second. Uh, more than half the time the wind will be right, in the, certainly in the trade winds, it's going to be there nearly all the time. Could we use these boats off the coast of Western Australia to create cloud cover to shade the landscape? You've got wind coming from the ocean to the land. You have quite a lot of control over the humidity uh, mm. that's going to happen in there. Uh, and it, you know, it comes and goes as day breezes and night breezes. You'd need a fleet of them to create enough cloud cover, so could they be remote controlled to sail in sync? I want to have them controlled by computers, not uh, not sailors, and that was ridiculed when I first started this work, which is quite nearly 20 years ago. Uh, people thought, come on, you can't have autonomous vessels. Now there's an increasing number of them, They're even having self-driving cars, which is a much, much more difficult problem to, the, the, than a self-driving ship. So we want something that can stay there and work for a long time without anybody attention. No worries about food or fuel or um, days off. Self-driving ships doesn't seem so unlikely now, but solar geoengineering is still highly contentious, right? The climate models so far show that th this really will work. At the moment, the objections to it are that there will be winners and losers and that it would reduce the enthusiasm for redu reducing carbon. Nothing must reduce the effort that's going into that. You don't agree? It's a bit like saying we can't have seatbelts because that will encourage people to drive dangerously. It is possible that it could have adverse effects. So we need to understand uh, everything about the results of this and only have the ones that we think people are going to want. The heat engine region in WA is vast, remote and sparsely populated. It could be a good laboratory to test this idea. It would be very nice if we could do that. Rain where it's a drought would be a, a great blessing. And we, we should be able to test that in, in with climate models quite easily to see uh, what time of year, uh, how much you need, and doing it which way the wind's blowing, that kind of thing. If Australia built a fleet and proved it was safe and effective to operate, I imagine we can make money renting the boats out when we don't need them. There are plenty of countries in our region facing dangerously hot summer heat waves. The uh, loss of ice in the glaciers up in the Himalaya would be very dangerous for millions and millions of people. And the heat that's melting those has come from the Indian Ocean. And so by being able to save the glaciers by fleets, there's a, there's a, there's an Indian Ocean would be an excellent use of them. The, the other thing is you can save the ice in the glaciers of Greenland and the North Pole and the Antarctic. Thank you, Professor Soltak. As we've explained, we know in Australia that the heat engine creates virtually all extreme heat events. If we take these steps to make it wet and green again, that'll help make the whole country cooler in time. This story has focused on actions we can take to cool the country here in Australia. Those ideas can work in other places, but it will take a whole lot more to cool the planet. The world is entering a new greenhouse period. High levels of atmospheric CO2 and water vapour could help us to re-green other heat engines like the Sahara Desert if we work with nature, not against it. Australia can show the way, starting in the Kimberley. Or we could frack it. Seriously. Protesters are fighting to stop fracking along the Fitzroy River in the Kimberley. We can choose to start cooling the country right there, or we can choose to squeeze a bit more gas from the ground. What's it going to be? We can restore degraded farmland in our dam catchments, starting with Warragamba, to better safeguard against droughts and floods. Or we can build more desalination plants. What's it going to be? I say we should try to cool the country.